Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with today's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at FunkinStuff.net and YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its podcast audio edition from FunkinStuff.net, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and most leading providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk, available at Amazon.com. Whether you're watching or listening, I thank you very much for uh, tuning in. My guest today is Reggie Calloway, who Funk and many other music fans best know as a founding member of one of the top-selling R&B bands of the 1980s, Midnight Star. As a trumpet player, singer, producer, and composer, Reggie played a leading role in a run of hit platinum and gold selling certified albums and singles from 1983 to 1986 that included such radio rotation mainstays as Freakazoid, No Parking on the Dance Floor, Wet My Whistle, Operator, Midas Touch, and Headlines. Although Reggie parted ways with the group in the late 1980s, his name continued, continued to be heard at radio and seen on the Billboard charts. That success included collaborating as a duo with his brother, Vincent Calloway, who had also been a Midnight Star under the name Calloway. They also produced and composed tracks for such artists as Teddy Pendergrass, The Deal, and Lavert, with Reggie writing that act's smash hit, Casanova. Although he continued to release music as a solo artist, Reggie later focused more on the music business, and in 2011, he began providing financing for artists and publishers who needed a way to monetize the royalty assets. He directed a sales team that was instrumental in bringing to the market thousands of song titles, and he continues to serve in that capacity. Just ahead, we'll learn more details, fill in the blanks, gain insights, and hear stories from Reggie's fascinating journey in music and life. Reggie, welcome. So good to have you here. How are you doing today? It's a pleasure to be here, Doctor. It's a pleasure to be here. I always like to, uh, to tell the stories and share and, uh, and reminisce and, and project futures and, and uh, all that good stuff. Excellent. Well, I'm so pleased and, and grateful to have you joining us today. Thank you so much. And um, we were talking a little bit before you're coming live from LA and I'm here in Charlotte. So hopefully uh, the spring weather is as nice there as it is here today. We have a good day today. It was a, it was a, a nice cold, kind of a sprinkly day yesterday, but that's always kind of romantic in Los Angeles because the weather is so consistent. So the day we're back to a, a cool day with sunshine and, and blue skies. Yeah, well, I always miss SoCal. It's still where my roots are, so good deal. All right, well, if you're ready, Reggie, we're going to jump into some questions. Ready to go? Ready to go. All right. So we're going to start way, way back, okay? Um, Going back to the uh, the early days, childhood, how, how, how you got into music, what it was like. Did you have a, a sibling rivalry with Vincent? Were there other music, musicians in the family? What was the Callaway household like, and where did the music come from? Well, I tell you, I was uh, when it's when it's in your in your DNA. You know, it just it just creeps out. You have no control. I mean, everything you see turns into an instrument. So. Uh, you know, our, our first instruments were pots and pans and the, and the famous oatmeal box. <laughs> so you can really get some cool sounds out of all those, you know. Because I always wanted that, that one, and I'd walk past the pawn shop on a regular basis and I'd, and I'd look at those bongos, so out of reach a long time. I finally did get myself a pair of bongos. <laughs> but during those lean days in the, the Louisville, Kentucky, in the projects, you know, we, we may do with what, what we had, but, but what we also had were uh, great grandparents uh, who had, had a, a piano at the house. So you could go by and uh, piano. My, my uh, uncle, who was only a few years older, he had taken piano lessons, so so he could actually read music, and we, we were totally amazed by that. And then uh, uh, the uncle, he also played piano and organ, uh, aunt, uh, opera singer, and uh, goes on on and on uh, just my father played trumpet so uh we'd go visit our grandparents and uh we would sit in front of the fireplace and and he would put us on his lap and you know and, and play the trumpet he played in high school he didn't really uh that but uh 
that exposure, the, the smell of the valve oil and the smell of the case, you just it just goes with you, you know. So consequently, we it's myself, Vincent, and uh, and uh, now my son played trumpet. My brother's daughter plays the trumpet, so we're like a trumpet family. <laughs> it's really cool. Well, when they say you keep a stiff upper lip, you really do. <laughs> well, that that horn, uh, you know, it, it served to uh, you know get me through high school, and you know the marching band, the jazz ensemble, and the all city orchestra, and then eventually go to college uh, after touring across the country with my band. Uh, but I said I better go back to school and learn something about music, and the trumpet got me a scholarship into Kentucky State University. And of course, that's where we formed Midnight Star. So, bring after that. And so, you, uh, Reggie, you're from Cincinnati, or where were you born? Where did you mostly grow up? I was born in, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, because my oh. father was in the Air Force. <laughs> so, so my brother and I, my older brother Greg and I, were both born in Cheyenne. Our family is from Louisville, Kentucky. My parents and father and mother, and the whole family is from and. Uh, the uh, Cheyenne when I was about old and I went back, back to Louisville and uh, stayed there uh, until the uh, grade. Uh, my mother and father had to, by then divorced and uh, moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. So Cincinnati is where my, my formative years, as they say, my growing up and uh, into to music and going to an elementary school that actually had a, a choir and a, and, a, and a little orchestra, violins, and uh, quite quite impressive. And in fact, the uh, famous jazz pianist Fred Hirsch, and uh, Fred played piano, uh, you know, fourth grade for for all the choirs, all the orchestras. He accompanied everybody. So when it came time for the All City Orchestra, not the All City Orchestra, the All City Choir, uh, I thought I was going to maybe be picked from our choir, but. But Fred Hurst was picked because he could play any song <laughs> anytime. He, he could he could sight read, do anything they needed to do. So uh, and that, it definitely worked out for Freddie to become a renowned uh, jazz pianist in the world today. So did you have some, I'm sure you had some musical uh, heroes back then that were doing uh, some contemporary music. You know, who were some of those influences? And when did you start, start getting your feet wet in terms of, you know, getting up on a stage and performing in front of folks? Well, coincidentally, when we moved to Cincinnati, our, our first home was right next to where a band practiced. <laughs> so they became, of course, our, our best friends. The children were, were the same age as, uh, as we were, just it, almost exactly. You know, uh, it was Greg's age and, uh, and Tim was Vincent's age. So, so we, we, we were like super family, but they would practice in the basement and, uh, you know, in in Ohio, unlike LA, you know, you have basements and you can hang your feet down in sort of the window well there. And we, we'd hang our feet there and look through the window and, and, and watch those guys practice and play, play R&B and funk. And we were like, what is this? Like, you know. Now in, in Kentucky, we had, we had the churches um, right next to uh, my mother's parents, the grandparents, there was a, uh, a Pentecostal church and Every if it was if it wasn't just every Sunday it was three or four nights a week they were jam I mean, tambourine singing organ it was just you know it, I never even I'm, I never went in <laughs> it was it was too powerful <laughs> so when we had that church experience there uh, the quiet Methodist church uh, and my mother sang in the choir and it, so I would you know sit there and break down the harmonies and try to figure out what they were what they were doing you know. You know, and how to create this music. So I was always just trying to study it, even you know, just by ear, at, at this early age. But uh, Cincinnati, you know, we just took it to another level because now we're we're sitting there watching guys actually play instruments. Not to mention the incredible Mr. James Brown, with uh, coming you know, recording at King Records and that whole deal. He would be a very very prominent. Uh, James Brown would come to Cincinnati and perform every Easter for 99 cents for all the kids. So just 99 cents to get in to see James Brown. I mean, and after you've done this for three or four or five years, you know, you, you, you kind of start knowing the show, but but then it was a big change when when Bootsy Collins and, and Phelps joined James Brown's band. 
So Boots has been my contemporary. He's just a little bit older than me to watch him go through that transformation and and, uh, and watch his, his other bands develop. He had a band called House Funk after that. Uh, James Brown and uh, uh, so it was just uh, to totally incredible. You know, go by and watch Bootsy's band rehearse, and you get this amazing uh, up close and personal touch that oh, this is actually possible. Not to mention the Ohio players. I mean, we could see the Ohio players at a ballroom and be so close that the, the horn, the valvole, and the, and the spit could, could hit you in the face because you were just standing right there. I mean, just watching these. These guys, these legends, just just do their thing. I mean, we had it was just a melting pot. I could go on and on and on. So you better ask me questions and direct me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so envious. I must have been so inspiring being in that kind of environment. You know, I mean, I grew up being a big fan of of, of them, and I would just get them, you know, in little snapshots when they would come through the Los Angeles area. But man, to be immersed in that must have just been something really special. Yeah. Well, you guys had some more of my favorites, Tower Power. You know, coming out of the Bay Area, you know, there was some, some more of our idol, Mandrill. You know, we learned all those songs. <laughs> Not to mention some function, <laughs> just the whole deal. But it's, it's, a, it's a serious melting pot. I mean, like, in, in Cincinnati, uh, just at Fifth Floor Studios, uh, you know, we'd go, we'd go in in the morning. Roger Trotman would come in in the evening. And then the late shift was the Ohio Players. You know, like for weeks at a time, just just going at it, making music. <laughs> That's awesome. So, all right. So, you know, let's talk around. I guess you know, high school age around there. Were, were you doing any uh, school dances? Did you, you know, have to deal stage fright at all, or were you always, you know, just completely comfortable going and performing in front of people? <laughs> I, I'm never really com comfortable. I mean, I'm not even comfortable to this day. But it's a part of that that nervousness or that uh, excitement that makes it excite exciting. If, if, you, if you get too comfortable, then you're just kind of going through the motion. So I, I get a charge, you know, every show, every audience. But it, it definitely was the younger training that uh, helped us to, to deal and to cope with that. In other words, uh, if you're playing a nightclub in front of five people, it's it's just as intense as, as in playing uh, the the Astrodome, you know, with fifty thousand people. So when you can translate and transfer that energy, uh, so when I'm, when I'm playing for fifty thousand people, I'm looking for that one person I can connect with, you know. And when I'm playing with that five people in the audience, I'm imagining that it's fifty thousand. <laughs> so for us, we we had a we had the talent shows. I mean, there was the uh, uh, University of Cincinnati had a had a fantastic talent show, Battle of the Bands. That we would get in every year, and there was it, it was somewhere in the city, you know, during that time. I mean, we were playing in nightclubs at 15 years old, uh, with the four horn section and rhythm section, and you know, you know, playing the songs of James Brown, playing all the cool in the gang songs. You know, we were we were we were studying the funk from from a serious position, and uh, so those talent shows really really brought it out of us because um, everyone was striving to. Be the best they could. I mean, we we practice on a daily basis. Where, you know, uh, you know, today people like to think they, they can practice once a week, you know, on a Saturday and, and get out and go do it. But but no no, you know, we go to school and then we go to practice. We do the weekends and we hope we had a gig. If we didn't have a gig, you know, we we practice. But uh, we would we would throw our own gigs. You know, you know, create our own talent shows. I would do talent shows at high school. We had a great show. Uh, at uh, Woodward High School, where I went to school, and that was uh, it was called Woodward Showcase, and that was more than a talent show. It was a production to where the, the orchestra, the choir, and the band all combined to do some type of big uh, musical number or create a, a show around it. But uh, that show died in one year, and you know, just like what? How could you in a tradition like that? <laughs> and with all the cutbacks that you know, they hit, they hit us back in those days as well. So I formed another talent show called Wood Rock, and. Uh, that, sh that show became a big talent show. My brother Vincent, his first band, performed at, at uh, our Woodrock uh, show, so that was historical. But also historical was that uh, uh, the group that would soon become The Deal also formed at one of, one of my Woodrock uh, talent shows back in high school, and they, and they won that show and they went on to do great things. So uh, we were definitely in a uh, world of get it done. You know, my mother was an entrepreneur, so... Uh, we always uh, strove to make it happen, whether it was happening or not. You know, being the president of the junior high student council, 
also being president of senior class. My brother was president of senior class, Greg. So we, we were making things happen. <laughs> you guys had a lot of get up and go. Uh, how many siblings did you have total? And was Vincent older or younger? Vincent's younger and then Greg's older. Uh, and then uh, so it was the, the uh, three of us. And then we have uh, some uh, some stepbrothers uh, down in, in Louisville, as well as our brother Sean. So it's a Somewhere between four and seven, it's as much of us. <laughs> but growing up in the house, it was just, just the three of us going together. And speaking of making it happen, you know, uh, so my mother uh, opened a, a flower shop. You know, she became a florist and uh, went to school for it. And, you know, kind of, she was gone for you know, weeks and months at a time while she was studying. We, you know, family took care of us and neighbors took care of us. And she finally uh, got her license and graduated, opened her own flower shop. She decided to put an ice cream parlor in the back so the boys would have something that was a, a little bit more uh, to our liking. <laughs> and uh, for the grand opening, who does she call? She calls James Brown and says, Mr. Brown, would you come to your, your sister's grand opening? And he actually said, yes. He says, but if there's a crowd outside, I'm just going to keep driving by. So he flew in on his Learjet, brought his limousine to the ice cream parlor, and uh, and did the grand opening. You know, we kept it very close knit with just the family and and uh, close friends uh, in, in the neighborhood. You know, so uh, that that really just in that year was when uh, I'm black and I'm proud was out. So uh, he was clean to the later. You know, in life, at midnight star, we actually opened for James Brown. So that was a, a great uh, uh, turnaround. It was uh, Washington D.C. and uh, it was a uh, a big uh, award. Honoring show, we actually had the pictures in my childhood and showed them to him. But we never saw those pictures. <laughs> am I am I feeding back now? I hear an echo. No, you're doing okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, well, that's a great story, Reggie. Um, so I, I guess we're talking around the mid '70s time frame or something like that when you kind of started moving toward um, Midnight Stars formation. Could you walk me through the the steps, the sequence of events that led to that happening, and you know how that how that came together, and how long were you together before you actually got signed? Okay, I'll, I'll go back really quickly a little bit. So around '15, uh, I got invited to be in a, in a band called the Motown Masters if you have it would. And uh, we were the ones that did all the talent shows and, and really, really awesome. Just a, a wonderful time. The band broke up and uh, then myself and uh, one of the other members of the same band were invited to play in Indy Fire Department. And Indy Fire Department was another awesome band. You know, they had three, three horns and full rhythm and choreography, the whole deal. And they asked me that, uh, Reggie, we can ready to go on tour, you know, because I was in high school. You know, would you see if your mother let you go on tour? And uh, that mean that meant leaving school early, of which I was the president of a senior class, so that was very difficult. And it meant uh, missing the prom that we were planning so hard for. But I knew what my, you know, my real work was <laughs> that I had to do in life. So I said, okay. My mother says, yeah, you can go. You know, and uh, the, the idea was that I would fly back home for graduation, no matter. I just you know graduated early because I had to had all my credits done. And uh, so I flew back for graduation and uh, it, I may as well have been gone for 10 years. It was like nobody knew me. I felt so out of place. <laughs> I was all ready to do the graduation speech, but they're like, you're not doing the speech. You left, let's gonna go to the, uh, to the vice president. And uh, my buddy Bobby Jones was my vice president. He did a great job. So, so we're out on the road uh, when, and we finally hit Las Vegas. You know, we traveled every little hole in the wall in the country. And, we hit Las Vegas and I said, God, we're going to Las Vegas. We finally made it. We're going to be on this trip. It's going to be awesome. We're going to get discovered. Uh, you know, you, you're sleeping on the, in the back seat while you're getting there. And then you wake up and you're in Vegas and, and you wake up and you're like, where are all the casinos and all the lights? Why are we in this, this neighborhood, this little, this little, uh, this little pocket in, in town, somewhere on the, you know, the, the, the lower South side or whatever the description might be, but it wasn't, it wasn't the strip. We were actually playing in a, in a sort of a neighborhood club. They didn't even have a, but what they did have was, was a stage with two full bands battling every night 
you know, for, for eight or nine hours, alternating sets, six nights a week. So not only was that a training ground, and this this other band, they were from Vegas, Clyde, him, and Hair. And they were, uh, we were like, you know, the best band out of Cincinnati, you, know, you, would, you, know, you would think, but these guys were killing us. <laughs> and the reason why they were killing us was because they were playing original songs. You know, they were putting on a show, they were, you know, you know, they, they had, you know, my, my guys were older. They were like, I was like 18, they were 26, and they were kind of getting stuck in their ways, you know. So, and plus, when you're playing that many hours, it's hard to practice because you got to rest up for the next night, you know. So you couldn't learn new songs, you couldn't write songs, and, and I'm trying to get them to do original songs because I want to learn how to write songs. And it just wasn't working. So when that when that tour ended, uh, uh, Sly and the Family Stone had an album out called In Time, and, 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 I, and I heard that song and I heard that album, and I said, God, I don't know anything about music, you know. This is contrapuntal funk in a whole nother zone. I said, I got to go to college. <laughs> so we, we drove back to Cincinnati overnight, you know, and, and uh, so I, I knew I knew then what I had to do. You know, I had to go study, you know, and learn more. You know, I couldn't um, just be a uh, a guy on the road playing cover songs. You know, this I was I had to be a composer. <laughs> and. Uh, so, you know, it came time to go back out for the next tour, and the guys asked my mother, oh, can, can Reggie go back out with us? We're going to go back out. And she says, Reggie's going to college. She said, you always knew he was going to college. <laughs> See, that was never a subject. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's when I, you know, I, I auditioned at uh, a couple places, but I got accepted at Kentucky State University to help my trumpet teacher and band director. And I got a scholarship, which, you know, for our household, you know, made it totally possible. And uh, <clears throat> just in time to get th get there for August marching band camp. So uh, big band camp and, you know, student at Kentucky State University. I played at one band there called Funkify, which was really cool playing with, with a bunch of college guys that, you know, that all had high levels of uh, musicality, so to speak, and, uh, and deep levels of funk as well. Uh, which was different than my, my guys didn't, didn't necessarily read music or anything. We just, they just played. You know, these guys had some, some more training and, that was a lot of fun, and we did a few original songs. Uh, but then it got to a point where, you know, while you're in school, you're in the band. When you go back home for the summer, there is no band. So when I went home for the summer, I, I formed my, my first my first band, which was a, a jazz, uh, sort of a jazz quintet, because I had all this, you know, this music I was learning in, in college, you know, playing in the jazz ensemble, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, all the theory that I was wanting to experiment. So this was like my experiment band. And we were called Sunchild. It was my, my myself, my brother Vincent, and my brother Greg on drums, and uh, Johnny and uh, Pete. And we had a couple of guys that. that well, sounds like a com sounds like a combination of Ramsey Lewis and Herbie Hancock titles. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> put put the, yeah. <laughs> we, I have to tell you my Ramsey Lewis story. <laughs> but anyway, so we, uh, you know, so once again, it's time to go back to school. So that band breaks up. Go back to Funkify. That back sometime for the summer. That band breaks up. Go back to Sunchild. So after the the second uh, third Sunchild, uh, Bill Simmons, who later became uh, a partner in, in Midnight Stars, will join Sunchild, and that was a we had a pretty pretty awesome addition there. And uh, I met some uh, wonderful people from New York while playing with this band. We were we we played in the legendary Viking Lounge in Cincinnati, which is where all the jazz guys came through. Everybody from um, Lionel Hampton, Jimmy Smith, uh, Roshan Malone Kirk. It was crazy. You know, you could just go see these guys <laughs> in a small, a small place. And uh, so I met this, uh, this, this these two ladies that, that said, "Same thing. We're gonna have to do for you. Let us know. You know, if you ready to ready to, to make it." And uh, I, so I kept that letter. And uh, this particular. Uh, well, the, this was around the highlight to where Sonny Stitt was coming to town, the legendary uh, great saxophonist uh, uh, heir apparent to uh, to, to uh, Co Coltrane and the, and the rest of the greats. So he was he was in that realm. Well, anyway, the club owner had this incredible idea. Why don't I, why don't I have Sunshine, who's packing my club with all these young college kids, back up Sonny Stitt? <laughs> so we actually played behind Sonny Stitt for two weeks. In the Viking Lounge, you know, doing uh, jazz classics and standards, as well as mixing in, 
you know, some of our more contemporary uh, compositions. So that was that was quite fun. So, uh, so she was this, the couple that that met us were like, you know, if the same thing we can ever do, let us know because they could see this vision. But once again, this band broke up because you know it's like sometimes people are, are a little afraid of of, of success. Success, you know, you could, I, it, I've seen it happen so many times. Uh, right when we were ready to make that commitment, you know, like we're going to quit college and we're going to, you know, do this thing, and these guys quit on us. So so, so back to college. <laughs> This time is when I said, I'm going to put together one of the greatest groups in the world. And I'm going to pick out all the best players on the university to have the same like kind of mind and ideals. And, uh, and, we, and we're going to go for it, you know. And that's when I uh, began to form Midnight Star. Of course, Bill Simmons was, uh, was, was first because he's my, my right-hand guy. He was there. And, uh, then we brought in the rest of the rhythm section, Jeff Cooper, Kendrick Gant. Uh, we needed a vocalist. Melinda Lipskin was 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 tearing up the place, from gospel to jazz to classical. She could sing it all. We do seminars, and people would come just to watch her perform. <laughs> so, uh, so Melinda was a was definitely a, a natural, and filled the band out with uh, two freshmen that had just joined us. Uh, Bo Watson, this amazing pianist and uh, and and vocalist, and. Uh, you know, Bo didn't really, you know, read, read a lot of music or whatnot. He just, he was just, you know, of course, out of the, straight out of the church, just incredible guy. And I said, dang, Bo, who's left for you to be in the band? Bo said, yeah, I'd love to. You know, the next day, Bo says, Reggie, I don't think I can do it. I said, why? He said, I came here with my best friend, Melvin Gentry. And we, we always said we stick together. I said, well, what does Melvin play? Guitar, bass, drums, sings. <laughs> like if he's after as good as you are. Bring him on. <laughs> so Melvin, Melvin came and joined us as well. And it all turned out that he, he definitely was that, that, that fantastic, that incredible. Uh, we brought my brother Vincent in, got him out of high school. It's like, you got to quit high school, get college. You got to quit high school and come join us now. So we'll have a full horn section. And, uh, you know, he joined us on the road. And uh, it's, just, it's just been wonderful. So that was, that was the college days. Yeah. So, so what? So, what year about that was there officially a Midnight Star? It was a. Uh, it was nineteen seventy six, and uh, so we, you know, we we stayed in school for a good while. Our, our first concert together was opening for Natalie Cole uh, at the at the homecoming, and and that was that was quite an experience. It was our own Kentucky State homecoming. We were the opening band for for Natalie Cole. Uh, and of course, years later, we get to produce and write for Nellie Cole. So what another, another circle, you know, to jumpstart my heart, hit record for her. So it came to a point where we knew we had to quit school. It was like, we can't just, uh, you know, be a weekend band. So we left uh, Kentucky State University and moved to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in, the, in the home of my grandparents, who were deceased at the time, of course. And then they had uh, kept the home in the family with my uncle and my father. So we had a place where we had to pay no rent. It was a little rundown. Had some mice there to keep us company at night, <laughs> but uh, it was definitely a, a honing ground because different locations. You know, we could be in one place and uh, practice and, and work and, and hone our craft and work on you know, choreography and, and show production and you know uh, cutting uh, live demos and it, it was an incredible time there. So you're, you know fine tuning and, and, and wood shedding and, and really making it perfection uh, with the band. Um, you eventually get your big deal getting signed by Solar Records. Um, tell me, you know, how that came about and, uh, you know, what you remember about that experience. Awesome. So uh, sometime off the band, my, my mother actually came to Kentucky State and then, then, then came to Louisville and began to, uh, you know, help direct us and, and mold the business side and the management side and the organizational structure and you know dividing the chores and making sure everybody was on point and you know creating this this well polished machine that could operate that could travel that could you know successfully get a truck and, and pack things up and make it happen. Uh, so we you know we had an agent we did a lot of uh, college gigs all around the area and whatever whatever we could do promoting our own concerts once again. But we got one offer to. Uh, uh, it was one beautiful place we did. It was uh, Highness, Massachusetts. I don't know why I, did, I love that that place. I got to go back. <laughs> that was a wonderful part of a tour. But 
again uh, for Kentucky, which we were ironically back there again after growing up there from, from the age of four. Uh, I reached out for that letter that I had from the, from, the, from the two ladies that said they could ever help. And, you know, was, this was, uh, uh, this is probably three years later, three or four years later, I reached out. I said, I think I finally got that group that we're talking about. I got the right unit now. She says, well, you want to come to uh, do a showcase in New York? I'm like, wow, yeah. So she set up a showcase for us in Palisades, New Jersey, at the soap factory. And uh, we loaded up everything that we basically had as college kids into the truck and into the cars and the trailer. And we were actually going to move to New York because we were going we were going to do our showcase. And if we didn't if we didn't make it, then we just stay there and do more. And if we didn't make it, then we just tackle the Big Apple. <laughs> and uh, so, so we, we got there the first night. Uh, we had put a lot of personal things in storage, and someone broke into storage and uh, and stole a lot of those personal things. You know, album. You know, just the little college kid stuff. Luckily, the equipment was still on the truck, and the costumes were on the truck, and the truck did not get broken into. So, <laughs> so we we effectively did the showcase. Uh, there was uh, Richard Aaron, uh, Ron Mosley was was there. Uh, Ron Mosley was a big uh, a record guy. Uh, had a really, really uh, great career. But uh, these guys saw us and you know, the word began to spread. So they told Dick Griffey about us. Uh, they were definitely close with Dick Griffey. Dick Griffey said, hold everything. Don't tell anybody else about these guys. <laughs> so uh, from there, uh, we said, we can't stay in New York. This, this is just not the place to, to rough it. <laughs> with, you know, with 12 people roughing it in New York, you know, we, we got to head back. But we can't go back to my grandparents' house, we just outgrown that. So we left uh, New York and moved to my mother's house in Cincinnati. So the whole band, Midnight Star, and the little crew, uh, like a good, good 12 of us was uh, all moved into my mother's house in Cincinnati. And uh, we really began to just totally tweak this thing. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd run three miles a day, calisthenics, rehearse all day, ride all night. And, uh, and we'd go on and on and on. So Dick Griffey wanted to come and see us. So we, we landed this Air Force Base tour. So we were touring Air Force bases all across the country, which was also our greatest thing because now we were actually performing about four nights a week, which we call rehearsal, and we were getting paid for it. So what a way to survive. I mean, you could actually you know pay some rent and, and uh, keep the refrigerator full and, and uh, have some consistency, you know, but consistency on the road. Uh, so Dick Griffey flew into... Uh, to uh, Las Vegas, we were at the Air Force Base in Las Vegas, and uh, I, well, I think that I, I skipped a step. I'm sorry. Okay, we were in Cincinnati. Uh, the first place Dick Griffey came to us was to see us in Cincinnati, and uh, we were at a club called the Palm Room. We set up a showcase just for him in the afternoon. Nobody there, just him in the audience and us on the stage. What a what a cold atmosphere. <laughs> So we do, we, we rip off a whole 40 minute show for him or however long it was. He said, you guys are good. He said, but you know what, you know what Reggie, I, 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 something's missing. I, I'm missing a harmony note there somewhere, somewhere. I don't know if it's in the background or the horns, I'm missing a note. And uh, so we had to come clean. Well, you know, Bill Simmons is, is ill. He had a collapsed lung, he's not performing. You know, he sings background and he plays saxophone. So part of the horn section is missing. <laughs> And we had so much respect for, for Dick after that, you have to say that, because you know, he's a drummer, uh, uh, but, you know, just a, uh, a very, very learned music uh, individual. And uh, so he says, I want to come see you guys again. So that's when he came to see us. So at the Air Force Base, you got, you know, 500 airmen screaming and hollering, full stage, excitement, bills back. So we killed it. And uh, so Dick's like, how would you like to sign to my little record label? I said, I said, I think I think we love to. <laughs> so uh, so he signed us and uh, kept us secret from everybody else in the industry as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. So. And, and that was and, and that was around seventy seven, seventy eight. What what year was? Where did you actually sign? It was seventy eight. So we signed in seventy nine. So we, we signed seventy nine. And did you stay in Cincinnati then, or did you move to L A. or what happened? Oh, we we definitely stayed in Cincinnati. Uh, you know, there's no way you can get uh, 
I mean, the, the, the rent probably was was uh, was less than four hundred dollars for for the house, and you couldn't beat that <laughs> with twelve people. <laughs> but but what we did do was uh, we more or less did go to go to L.A. because we uh, we recorded the first album in Los Angeles, so uh, brought the whole band out. We, we came out to Los Angeles on, on Lakeside's tour bus, so that's how we that's how we met Lakeside, who's from Dayton, Ohio, down the road. But we actually met him, you know, uh, after after we all was kind of signed. So we well, we take the tour bus out to L.A. I was staying at at Richard Aaron's father's house, so so we're 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 at his his parents' house. Yeah, so we spent about a good three months making that album, you know, in Los Angeles, and. Uh, we eventually, uh, you know, finished the album. Went back to, to Cincinnati. Went back on another Air Force Base tour, but this time we're touring with our own album. So it's a little bit different. <laughs> so we, we're very, very proud and uh, get to play more of our own music. But the big thing was it. It was uh, you know the first album, second album, third album. We didn't get a major worldwide, uh, international, national hit until our fourth album. So that's a, a testament to uh, Dick Griffey's uh, ability. You to stick with us and uh, and keep giving us more and more rain and more control as opposed to less. Yeah, and it's fascinating to hear that whole story, Reggie, because you know it it supports that notion that there aren't very many actual true overnight successes. You know, you really got to put the work in, you got to put the time in, and uh, hopefully, you have someone like Dick Dick Griffey who allow you to you know develop and get to that point where you can really go to the next level. <laughs> 